Okay. So let us start. First of all, I want to remind you that uh, on Thursday there will be a quiz. Mm? And so this quiz every Thursday from now on. Mm? And, um, and that's basically where um, um, you're going to get your grades from. Mm? All right. So, and the quiz is, uh, I remind you, it's a yes and no thing. You just basically have to go through what uh, uh, you've been um, hearing from me in the last uh, few lectures and you know you should be fine with the material I've given to you I just this and there are no trick questions okay so I, 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 I don't uh, the, the, the questions and are very straightforward okay um, you will see also that um, in the e class you get Lots of material, okay, uh, because it's a technology course, and I, you know, I, I want to make sure that um, as someone will graduate and, and work in the industry, the industry, uh, you know, you can go back to this course and you know, get information from it that's um, in some way useful to you in your um, in your um, activities at that time. So. Good, so let's just, um, again uh, continue with what we had started, um, namely the introduction. Um, you're all familiar, I, I uh, assume, with uh, uh, phase diagrams. So phase diagrams are very useful. We'll, um, uh, we'll use a number of diagrams quite often, uh, such as phase diagrams. And uh, so what do we use for? Is, first of all, we, we use them as tools, right, in our course. We, we're not going into calculate how you calculate them, what, what they mean in terms of uh, thermodynamics. I assume you know these things. And we'll, we'll use them as tool in this course. And uh, so what, what uh, does it tell us? Is that any point on this uh, diagram, yes, uh, uh, has a, uh, a, uh, a temperature and a composition, for instance, carbon content here. And, um, and there's also information about uh, the phases involved in the microstructure at that time. So in this particular case, uh, I will have gamma phase and cementite. Hmm? If I have three points, say 2%, um, yeah? So I, I will not only have uh, information about the number of phases, the type of phases, also the composition of each phase. It will tell me that at this temperature, the austenite contains this much, 1.5% uh, of carbon, and that the cementite contains 6.7% of carbon. Hmm? Right, so I will also, there are a, a number of uh, points that are of interest here. Uh, for instance, this structure, the, the microstructure I get here is a very well-known uh, lamellar microstructure that we call the eutectoid, yes? And um, we will, so if we add the information here uh, on the graph, hmm, um, I uh, uh, want to tell you that when we uh, look at steels, hmm, uh, we typically define them as uh, iron carbon alloys with less than 2% of uh, uh, carbon, and you can see where this point, uh, where this definition comes from, it, it's due to the maximum solubility of carbon in austenite hmm, at around a temperature close to 1200 degrees C. Hmm. Um, many steels um, that uh, we're dealing with is, of course, uh, do not have this level of carbon. Hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, most steels will have l up to 1% of carbon, yes? Then you have you know, close to 99% of the steels that uh, you will encounter. Hmm? Um, so we'll go up to nine, uh, excuse me, um, about a percent of carbon, yes? Um, and um, a lot of steels are produced with even uh, less carbon with about 0.5% of carbon. So of all this huge, big 
complex phase diagram, the most important part of it is this little piece here. Is this little piece, hmm? which from zero to a half a percent of carbon. Hmm? And so no wonder that a lot of research is being done on you know, what, what, going, what goes on here, but it's pretty simple in terms of uh, you know, the, the phase diagram itself. Hmm? Right. Hmm? Let's move on. Okay. Now, this is a binary phase diagram. So anytime uh, we talk about steels, if you remember last uh, lecture where I wasn't there, but I, I, I hope you uh, listened to the, uh, the video. The, uh, you know, we talked about silicon and manganese and chrome, etc. So uh, we have uh, a multi-component system. Uh, steels are multi-component alloys. And so these, um, uh, this, this phase diagram doesn't look like this anymore because it's not a pure binary iron carbon. And uh, in particular, you will have this, this austenite, this region here we call the austenite stability range. Yes, this range here will be influenced, will, be, uh, will become larger or smaller depending on the alloying. Yes? One of the things uh, by which you can um, describe the, uh, the effect of alloying elements is by, by looking at this eutectoid temperature and what happens when you add elements to um, the, uh, the austenite here yes, is, well, first of all, the eutectoid composition, yes, the eutectoid composition, that is this composition here, yes, um, goes from 0.8, yes, to a lower value. Hmm? So that means the eutectoid composition moves to lower carbon content. And this is independent of whether or not um, the alloying element you add is austenite stabilizer or um, ferrite stabilizer. You can see here. Uh, nickel and austenite stabilizer uh, has this effect and titanium also. Hmm? All right. The, however, the eutectoid temperature, yes, the eutectoid temperature is, moves in a very specific direction. Hmm? If the element, so you can see here, I have, if this is the eutectoid temperature, yes, hmm, this is this temperature here. Um, it's around 720 degrees C, yes. If I add a ferrite stabilizing element, so ferrite stabilizing element, this point will move up hmm? yes, and in temperature. If I add austenite stabilizing elements, such as nickel and manganese, it will move down. Hmm? And that is in line with the increase in the stability range of the austenite. Hmm? Okay, good. So um, in this diagram, there are a number of things. Um, because you're in steel research, you should know. Hmm? And uh, so in particular, um, you should know that uh, there is a, in this system, there is a eutectic here. It's not, again, it's not really important when you're dealing with steels, yes. Um, at 1148 degrees. This is important here, this point here at 0.77% of carbon. That's the eutectoid uh, composition and the eutectoid temperature is 727 degrees C in, in the uh, system, yes. The other thing you should know is that the carbon content of the cementite is about 6.7% of carbon, yes? And that we call all the steels with carbon contents less than the eutectoid composition. We call them hypo, yes, eutectoid. And the ones that are above this, we call them hyper eutectoid, okay? What's, and we'll see what the big difference is, okay? All right. Okay. right. So if we are uh, in steel compositions very close to 
uh, this point, very iron rich uh, composition, then we see ferrite. And, and many, ac many steels actually look like this. Many carbon steels, carbon steel looks like it. There's nothing much to see. Small grains, equiaxed grains, and it's ferritic. And uh, there may be lots going on, uh, but the microstructures are pretty simple. Hmm? All right, so um, good. Now, once we add carbon, yes, we'll start seeing things happening. Hmm? In particular, there will be some reactions, yes, and again, we will focus on this part of the diagram in this lecture, so let's see what happens. So at high temperature, we have the austenite, and at low temperature, we have ferrite. We know if it's pure iron, but in the case of uh, the iron carbon diagram, we have ferrite and cementite at uh, room temperature. So what happens? Well, if we have the composition, this uh, eutectoid composition, we know that the austenite transforms into ferrite and cementite in a lamellar fashion. But, and, and this happens at this 720. But uh, for many steels, we're actually dealing with part of the diagram that you can't actually see here. Yes? So I blow this up, I blow this part up, and this is what I see. I see, uh, of course, uh, ferrite stability range, yes, up to 910 degrees C. So above this, pure iron is stable. And then, as I add um, uh, carbon, the austenite stability range increases. Yes? So this temperature here decreases. So this, is, this temperature here is called the A. E3 temperature. It is uh, uh, the eighth. The, the many of these lines here, because they're used so often, they ha uh, we don't. We just call them by. Uh, uh, we, we label them. So, so this is uh, the uh, the A3 temperature. The E E stands for equilibrium. Yes, and um, so this is this line here. This line, this is the A3 line. This line here, mm, the eutectoid uh, uh, temperature, this horizontal line here, is the AE1 temperature. Mm. And while we're at it, the name of this line is a CM line. A CM line for the precipitation um, of uh, cementite, yeah? and when it has a little e, it means it's the equilibrium temperature. So here the e means it's equilibrium temperature. Why do we specify this? Because when, um, when we heat steels or we cool steels, the temperature at which these uh, transformations, transformation reaction happen, are not exactly A3. When you heat up, the transformation tends to be at a higher temperature. And when you cool down, the temper this transformation tends to be at a lower temperature. Hmm? So uh, we give them other names. When we heat up, we call them a C3 line. And when we, call and we cool down, we call them the a R3 line. Yes. And so the, the C and the R come from French. The E also comes from, e, e comes from equilibre, equilibrium. A C comes from chauffage, meaning heating. The C of chauffage. Heat. And R comes from refroidissement, which means cooling in French. Hmm? Okay. And the same for A E1. You have an A uh, R1, and you have an A excuse me, an A C1 and an A R1 temperature. Hmm? Okay, and those are the things you, you generally measure uh, and that are of importance to you if you're running a, um, a um, industrial line that involves uh, heat treatments because that's the temperature at which the transformations will happen. Hmm? Okay. So let's have a look at some um, uh, structures here. So if, if you have the eutectoid composition, 
uh, the microstructure looks like this. Hmm? So you, this microstructure you know is called perlite, and it's alternating layers of ferrite and cementite. If you've never seen perlite, uh, there are a number of people that, that do research on perlitic steels. Um, it polishes, when it polishes, it makes a very nice um, silvery shine, and people call it, it looks like pearl surface. Hmm? And so that's where the name comes from. Hmm? It's not somebody's name, uh, or, or it just looks like um, this nice gray, um, nice gray uh, surface. Hmm? Hmm? All right, good. So now, um, just a few words about what, uh, what are these compositions above this 2% are, do we use these alloys? Yes, we do. We, we use them actually quite a lot. Um, and um, we call them cast irons, yes? And again, very different metallurgies, yes? Um, and uh, and uh, microstructure controls will not talk about cast irons in the course of our lecture. This is an example here where um, you can see one of the big differences that you can have in um, cast irons. This is a, what is called a gray cast iron. And instead of having cementite, you know, Fe3C, in the uh, microstructure, we have graphite. Yes? And in, and in this particular uh, uh, cast iron, this uh, graphite is nodular, forms little nodules, yes? Okay. Now let's go back to our um, steels. In steels, and so in steels we, we don't see graphite, we see cementites and carbides. Hmm? And the, um, uh, so, so what happens now if you have so go back here. If you have compositions which are hypoeutectoid and hypereutectoid, how do they compare in microstructure? Well, you can see it here, yes? Um, so here the composition is very close to 0.77, but a little bit less than. So here the carbon is less than 0.77. Percent, and here the carbon is larger than 0.77 percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and so what you get is you see you still see the perlite in the microstructure, yes. And he, here you see the perlite also, but in this case you have ferrite, these ferrite grains, yes that surround these perlite islands. And here you see this white streak here, this white streak is actually cementite. Yes, and this is called primary cementite. And in this case, we have primary ferrite. That means when you transform the austenite to ferrite and cementite, first you form ferrite in the hypoeutectoid composition steels and you form primary cementite in the hypereutectoid yes situation so this is just illustrate again let's let's say you have 0.2 percent of carbon so it, when you cool this material to room temperature like this the first phase to form from the austenite will be Ferrite. You come in this region here, ferrite plus austenite. Yes. So the first phase to form is this. Are these primary, yes, primary ferrite grains? Yes. You know that uh, at this temperature, you will have two phases. One will be a very low carbon ferrite. That would be this grain here, right? And you will have this high carbon austenite. Yeah? This is the, these are the two phases. Yeah? And as you cool down, 
the composition of the austenite will move to this, and the composition of the ferrite will move to this. Hmm? Okay. Eventually, you reach 727 degrees, and the remaining austenite transforms to perlite. And this is what you see here. This, this used to be, this is this austenite that transforms. Yes? Okay? So, of course, if I have very little, um, uh, less carbon, hmm, I will have more ferrite in the microstructure. And as I increase the carbon, I, I get more and more perlite in the microstructure. When I have a composition that's, for instance, 1.2% of carbon, what happens here? When, when I cool, yes, let's say in this region here, right? At, at this point here, I will start forming primary cementite at these grain boundaries, yes? The composition of the austenite will move along this till it hits this point, and there, the remaining austenite transforms to perlite. So let me just go back to remind you of, right? So, um, so in this particular case, for instance, let me get, uh, yes. I'll, I'll do it a little bit later, just, just to remind you of, uh, okay, let's just, uh, so you just seal this. Okay, so what, what you ha have, for instance, if you, if you go from, say, 0.1 to uh, about 0.77% uh, of carbon, yes, you get the amount of ferrite decreases, yes, and the amount of perlite increases. Yeah? So at about 80.77% uh, of, car of carbon, the structure is fully, we say, fully perlitic. So how do, we, how do we know how much of uh, each phase we have? Well, we use the, uh, what's called the lever rule. Hmm? So for instance, if at this temperature and this carbon content, 0.2% of carbon, I want to know how much, I know I have alpha, with this composition, yes, and gamma with this composition, yes. I want to know what's the phase fraction. Well, I measure this piece of length and I call it A, yes, and I measure this piece and I call this C, yes. So then the phase fraction of alpha is equal to A divided by C plus A, yes? And the phase fraction of gamma is C divided by C plus A. All right? Okay, so I can always, also from the phase diagram, determine the phase fractions to expect. So here, um, for instance, for perlite, um, I see uh, ferrite, yes, and cementite. Yeah? So uh, if I want to know what is the phase fraction of each phase, in this case, well, I have its perlite, so say it's about 0.77%. What phases do I have? Well, I have ferrite plus cementite. The cementite is here, yes. So let's get rid of uh, of this here. And yeah. So what is the amount of yes, of ferrite and cementite? Well, so this left here from here to here, I call um, uh, A, yes. And the uh, from here to here, yes, I call C. So the fraction 
of ferrite, for instance, is equal to hmm, A divided by uh, C plus A. Hmm. And I can just can measure this because C plus A is uh, 6.69, yes? Yes. And uh, A is 6.69. Nine minus 0.77, yeah? Okay? If you calculate this, you will find the phase fraction of, of ferrite. Hmm? Hmm? Okay? All right, good. Right, so now one of the things we're very interested in, in uh, when we make steels, when we process steels, is we want to know um, uh, what happens when we process steels in conditions which are non-equilibrium, yes? Because um, when you heat up uh, your steel, you cool it down, you deform it at high temperature, you use a certain heating rate, a certain cooling rate, and uh, the information you have from the uh, equilibrium phase diagram is of limited use. So we need to have information about the transformations, yes, and their dependence on the undercooling most of the time. Hmm? So we'll see what happens. We'll first uh, uh, re, uh, go through this analysis of um, the effect of the cooling rate or the undercooling first. Um, and we'll look at the isothermal eutectoid transformation. So, so what we do here is we go from austenite with 0.77% carbon and we cool down to below 727. And we do this at different temperatures. Yes? So I go, what I basically say, I go suddenly to this temperature or to this temperature and then I keep the temperature constant. Yes? So I do the transformation isothermally, I keep the temperature constant, and I do it at a certain amount of undercooling, yes? So for instance here, the, the undercooling being the temperature below the AE1 temperature. Okay? So let's see what, what we have, okay? Right, so what we see, yes, is that, uh, the speed, the kinetics of the transformation are very sensitive to the undercooling, yes? Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you measure the, the amount of perlite formed as a function of time, it doesn't go like this, right? There is no instantaneous transformation, yes? This does not occur, yes? The, the transformation is not instantaneous, yes? The, why, why is it not instantaneous? Because the perlite needs to grow from the austenite. Yeah? So, and this requires that the carbon be redistributed. Yes? In addition to the phase transformation. So you need to form ferrite. You also need to redistribute the ferrite between the cementite and the um, Ferrite, okay? So, what, so what, what happens actually? Yes. Um, so if we um, have a small undercooling, for instance, we're close to, close to the AE1 temperature, yes? what we see is that if we plot the transformation in a log diagram, in a log with a log time scale, we see an S-shaped curve, yes? If we increase the undercooling, yes, we make, we go lower and lower, we see that the transformation actually goes faster. I want to point out that uh, the undergraduate years, very often people say, oh, this, this, this curve is S-shaped, yes? 
the shape of the curve depends very much on the, what you use as a um, x-axis. If, if I were to uh, plot this on a uh, on a regular uh, linear time plot, you wouldn't see much of this S shape. Yes, this is a log uh, diagram. So, so at six hundred degrees C. Um, you, you say the transformation is faster. Actually, it's extremely much faster. Yes, because here it takes maybe five seconds to be fully done. Yes? Here it takes uh, 20 at 100 seconds. This is probably 500 seconds. Yeah? So uh, this is not faster. It's much, much faster. Okay? So it's very sensitive. But, uh, when you plot the log time scale, it kind of you expand, you know, the um, the, the, the short time scale. Right? So be yeah. okay, right? So now, um, why what why does this curve have this shape? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and. Um, and, and so why isn't this, this um, uh, transformation, the formation of perlite, instantaneous? Well, it's because um, this particular transformation and many transformations uh, that we are dealing with in uh, high temperature uh, transformation uh, are the result of nucleation and growth. So, um, so in this S curve, here in the region where nothing, seems, nothing much seems to happen, yes, what you actually... Uh, you're in the nucleation stage. Yeah? So we make small nuclei yeah, that becomes larger and larger. Yes? So in this nucleation rate, this is important, yeah? we, uh, we see that the nucleation is higher when delta t is larger. Yeah? So you get more nucleation yes, when the... Um, uh, when the undercooling is larger, hmm? and the reason is because you have a high dr higher driving force for the transformations. Hmm? And if you want to have it in terms of thermodynamics, the free energy change is larger, so um, not lots of nucleation. Right now, in the growth stage, yes, in the growth stage, you see the the, the particle or whatever, the uh, perlite islands grow, yes? And in order to grow, you have to have diffusion, yes? And long-range diffusion, yes? So the growth rate, yes? Rate of growth is higher at high temperature, at small delta T. And the reason is simply because at higher temperature, the diffusion, yes? So um, in the nucleation stage, we have the free energy that plays a big role, free energy differences. In the growth stage, we have the diffusion is important, yes? And why does the curve not continue like this, yes? But goes like this, gives you this S shape, yes? It doesn't go like this. That's because as the these islands of perlite starts to uh, uh, grow, mm, they will start impinging on each other, yes? And they will prevent each other's growth in certain directions where they touch each other. So th and that gives me this lowering of the um, kinetics at the later stages, okay? Okay. So let's, let's, let's view this process of uh, nucleation and growth, yes? And it's important for you to realize that nucleation and growth are not separate stages. They're, not, they're happening at the same time. Yes? So you have, from the very beginning, <coughs> you have a nucleation rate at a certain temperature, <coughs> excuse me, and you have a growth at a certain temperature. So if I start at T0, there's nothing, yes? And uh, delta T 
uh, I have two particles. So what is my uh, nucleation rate? This is a unit volume. So my nucleation rate is two particles per unit time per unit volume, right? So that means that after two delta t, three delta t, every time I will see two new nuclei will uh, <coughs> be formed, yes? But of course, there is also growth. That means these nuclei will grow at a certain rate, yes? So the change in their radius per unit time, yes, um, is a certain value. Yeah? See, so here they're, for instance, they're uh, one uh, nanometer in size. Here they're two nanometers in size, like, etc. So their uh, growth rate hmm, is, um, uh, and, and, and you see this, you, you get, at the same time, you get growth and nucleation at the same time. So it's, it did not separate stages. Right? There's not like a stage where uh, you form nuclei and then, and then that stops and then you have a growth stage. It happens at the same time. Okay, so, so let's go back now to what happens to perlite. Yeah? So we have, um, so in the nucleation stage, we, but we still talk about the nucleation state. Yeah? It's because the rate of the nucleation is higher. Yes? We have, of course, there's nothing. So uh, the main thing that happens is uh, nucleation. Yes? Um, and we have, um, so the, the, I've already told you that uh, if you do the, the formation of perlite at lower temperatures, there's lots of driving force, free energy difference. So, um, um, we will have a uh, higher nucleation rate. The, in the growth process, what is important there is diffusion. Yes, diffusion of atoms towards the growing uh, phase, yes? And that is higher at high T or at small undercooling. So if we look now at the perlite situation. Hmm? So I have austenite and I look at the perlite islands, or we call them colonies, yes, uh, packs of parallel uh, lamellas. Yeah? The, uh, the temperature just below the eutectoid temperature, the nucleation rate will be low, and the growth rate will be high. So I get fewer larger colonies. Hmm? If the temperature is very far below TE, yes, I get a very high nucleation rate, but these nuclei don't grow very large, yes, because the diffusivity is low. Hmm? And in between, yes, I have an intermediate nucleation rate and an intermediate uh, growth rate, okay? All right, okay. So you can track the change, different ways to do this. Uh, this transformation. Hmm? Uh, for instance, we look at the transformation at 675. So what this is, we, we track the percent that's transformed as a function of the log of the time, and we measure where the transformation starts, where it's 50% transform, and where it reaches 100%. Hmm? And we, we use this data, and we put it on a diagram of temperature versus the same time, yes? And of course, at one temperature, I, I get one point for the start of the transformation, 50% transformed and 100% transformed. And I can do this at different times, yes? Excuse me, at different temperatures, hmm? different isotopes. And I will get these curves, these typical C curves, um, which are uh, uh, characteristics characteristic of um, nucleation and growth transformations in, in, in alloys, yes? Okay, so what we see is that um, at very close to 727, uh, I do, I, you know, it takes a very long time for the, the perlite reaction to start because I have 
very little nucleation rate. There's very little driving force for the uh, formation of perlite. But then as I reduce the temperature, uh, it, at around 550, the kinetics are very high. Yeah? It takes you know, seconds yeah, for the transformation to be complete. Mm? And as I continue reducing the temperature, the, the kinetics uh, are slower again. Mm? Mm -hmm. And so if, if we would look at it uh, picturally, yes, for, so at this point here, from, from all this region here, uh, austenite grains are stable, yes? Uh, then they tr uh, start to transform to perlite, and then at the red, the, the, the microstructure is fully transformed, okay? Because that's what happens. There's another thing that happens is that um, as we uh, increase the... Uh, um, the undercooling, hmm, the, uh, you can refine the perlite. You can make it finer. The reason is that at lower temperatures, diffusion is slower, perlite is finer, and the colonies are smaller. So you can refine the microstructure by choosing the temperature. So you get the same phases, pretty much the same composition, but the microstructure is refined. And this is a, a trick that is very often used to, um, uh, to do transformations at lower temperatures to refine the microstructure. And one of the reasons why you would refine the microstructure is to make it more homogeneous. And if you're concerned about mechanical properties, you also, the, the, the refined microstructure, and we'll see why that is, has a higher strength. Hmm? Uh, so, and at, uh, Higher temperature, we have faster diffuser, coarser perlite, and larger colonies. And again, the reason is because the nucleation rates are so small. Right? Okay, good. But say uh, we're doing this uh, transformation, we, we form perlite, and um, what happens if we continue dropping the temperature. Do we, you know, this, we get finer and finer, progressively finer uh, microstructure. No. Uh, as you reduce the temperatures, yes, um, you get into a situation where the diffusion becomes very uh, almost impossible. At what temperature is that? Well, uh, below 550. 550 to 500 degrees C, okay? you can assume that the diffusion of substitutional solutes, so elements such as uh, manganese, silicon, moly, chrome, etc., in steels, substitutional solute, is finished. There will not be any uh, movement of these uh, species anymore. Yeah? Um, what about interstitials, such as carbon? They can still move over long distances. And that has an impact on the transformation. Be, you know, so below the 550 to 500 temperature range, yes, you stop making perlite. And you make another what we call a decomposition product, and that's bainite. Yes? And, and so what's, what's specific about uh, bainite, yes, is that the, um, the growth yes, is a combination of diffusionless processes and diffusion controlled processes. So how can something be at the same time diffusionless and uh, uh, diffusion control? Well, there is no diffusion of substitutional elements and there is diffusion of interstitials. That's basically what the definition means. Okay. So at low temperatures, if you look at the microstructure, you don't get these lamellas anymore. What you get is bainite. This is a very fine, much finer microstructure, as you can see here. And we'll say a few more words about this as we go along. All right. Okay. All right. So you have... Uh, uh, made either perlite or, or bainite, but you have a structure, yes? And it's, say, lam lamellar. And uh, 
is that the uh, equilibrium structure that the material will will have? Well, no. If you if you would say I'll, I'll just continue holding on at this temperature, let's say at 600, I'll wait for a long time, hours and hours. Yes. Do the same thing with bainite. I see that the microstructure will continually evolve and you'll end up having what's called spherodite. Spherodite, there, the, instead of having a lamellar microstructure, you get these cementite nodules. So why, why does this happen? Yes, why do I get, uh, that is uh, uh, simply because in the uh, perlite you have lamellus of alternating ferrite and cementite. And so you have lots of interfaces, yes? Lots of interfaces. And um, they contribute energy, yes? Interfacial energy, yes? And it's very high in a perlite. So in comparison, this a situation where you have a spherical uh, cementite nodule, yes, it has a much lower uh, surface energy. And so long term, cementite will tend to become spherical and form spherodite. Um, this is not uh, ac of academic interest only. Uh, spherodite, spherodization is very common. Um, uh, in certain products, steel products. Mm -hmm. um, very many, uh, in particular, wire products, yes, uh, go through this stage of spherodization in order to make them very soft. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, so this is an example here of this spherodization, and we call this globular cementite. Of course, you've all heard of martensite. Yeah? In, in the case of martensite, there the, uh, the transformation is fully uh, uh, diffusionless, so there's no substitutional diffusion, no interstitial diffusion, and uh, depending on the carbon content, your, your lattice, your BCC lattice can be distorted, yes? Uh, you can have different types of martensite, yes, from lath martensite to uh, plate martensite. Yes? What is interesting about the martensite transformation is it's a, in low carbon steels, it's, it's athermal. Athermal means uh, it's not time dependent. Yes? So if you, uh, so you, as you know, there is a MS start temperature. Yes? So if you go to a certain undercooling, mm -hmm. yes? uh, you will get a certain amount of martensite. And if you keep it there, nothing will happen. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah? So that's definition of athermal. Yeah. So if you want to make more martensite, you have to decrease the temperature. Yes. If MS is below room temperature, it's not going to transform to martensite unless you cool it below room temperature. Okay. So very important about athermal transformations; they're not time dependent. They're driven by undercooling. You want more martensite, you have to go below. You want to have 100% martensite you have to go below the MF temperature. MF temperature is the, uh, the temperature at which the transformation is done. And this is actually um, a very common um, uh, form of martensite, which we call lath martensite. Mm -hmm. Very um, a complex microstructure. You can't say really much about them unless you look into this microstructure with a, a TM. You see, actually, the, uh, the microstructure. It, it's very difficult to, if, unless you're working with bainite and martensite for your research, very difficult to tell them apart, yes? Um, 
But this, this is the uh, uh, very common uh, form of martensite that you get in low carbon uh, steels. Okay? So there are many so what we call engineering steels, the steels we um, build machines with, have this microstructure. Okay. But if you have high carbon martensite, yes, this is the microstructure you get. Yeah? Very different. Yeah, very different. Uh, and so uh, actually there are two phases here. Uh, these feathers are martensite, and you can see there's still white, this white background here. That's austenite that has not transformed. So this is austenite, so, so, uh, so these feathers here, right, are uh, martensite, usually alpha, we, we say alpha prime. And it's here, it's is called, it's is austenite, it's, it's austenite, hasn't transformed. So why would that, why would that happen? How, how can you have these two phases at room temperature? Well, it's very simple. If this is the temperature, and this is the time, hmm? And say, this is room temperature, room temperature, yes? And your transformation, so this is the MS temperature and this is the MF temperature, yes? And you cool down to room temperature, yes? Then the amount of transformation will be such that it's not fully transformed. It's not fully transformed because MF is below room temperature. The transformation is only partial, and it stays like this. Yes. So that's an interesting thing to do, to yes, to control the range of MF and MS. Yes, because that allows you to keep austenite, yes, stable at room temperature. Yes. You have to realize, for instance, this. Uh, steel, the, the temperature, according to equilibrium diagram, yes, the temperature at which the austenite should transform is about 700 degrees C. This is at room temperature, yes, you've got austenite, yes, it's stable at room temperature. Not for five minutes, but forever, yes, okay, because the transformation is thermal, yeah, okay. So, very interesting property, yes? So you can, you, can, you can actually, by doing some clever things in steels, which, uh, you know, you can, have, you can have high temperature phases at room temperature, yeah? Or stable at room temperature, okay? And of course, uh, the presence of this gamma phase, it's, you cannot, uh, it's not going to, you're going to find this on a phase diagram, right? Because the phase diagram tells me at this temperature, the stable phases are ferrite and cementite. Okay? Okay, right, and so the, so the, 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 the Martensic transformation, how it's, as I said, it's not diffusion transformation, it's, it's, um, it's called a, um, uh, shear transformation, hmm? so it basically means that the austenite is transformed to by very specific shear. Yes? So all the atoms before and after the transformation have a specific position. Yes? That's not the case when you have a diffusion and, um, excuse me, a nucleation and growth process. The, um, the position of the atoms after the transformation are due to random diffusional jumps, yes? So for instance, uh, here, uh, you, you can see that uh, for this specific shear here, this is the austenite piece of the austenite microstructure. You can see here, I've shown a 1, 1, 1 plane, yes? And you can see here this nice hexagonal shape of the 1, 1, 1 plane, yes? When we shear it in this specific direction, exactly this amount, uh, this uh, uh, phase is turned into a 110 phase of 
a, um, a, a PCC or, or Martin site. Okay, so again, very different uh, 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 shapes uh, of Martin site. So here again, this was this um, uh, what we call lenticular. This this Martin site here is called lenticular. Yeah, because it's formed, the shape is like a lens, yes? The reason why it's formed is, is because of strain energy associated with the transformation. But you can have plate. Here you have the martensites are, are plates. And so here, dark day is uh, what we call epsilon martensite, and, uh, and this here is just um, um, austenite. So you, and this, is, uh, this plate type martensite is very common in the iron manganese alloys. So studying uh, this uh, uh, transformation to Martin sites important. Yes, we um, have different ways to to look at uh, this transformation. Martin site, but one of the things that is important in connection with uh, Martin site, and certainly for engineering steel, is the idea that's called hardenability concept, hardenability concept. So, so in engineering steels, natural people don't talk much about hardenability because they don't very often make martensite yes, as a microstructure. But people that make um, motor parts, for instance, um, use this microstructure, uh, this martensite. So they want to know how easy can I make martensite? Can I make this high um, can I make this special microstructure? Hmm? Um, and in particular, they want to know, because they make parts which have a certain section, yes, they want to know if I cool down at a certain uh, cooling rate, yes, uh, how easy is it to get a fully martensitic microstructure? So first of all, first of all, we need to know why are these people interested in Martensite? So, so why uh, Martensite uh, for engineering steels? Well, for a simple reason is because Martensite, fer what we call ferrous Martensites, can have very high strengths. Yes. Um, the uh, a typical ferrous Martensite can give you. 1.5 gigapascal, 2 gigapascal in UTS, ultimate tensile strength. Yeah? That's very high. Yes? And that's mostly achieved through carbon, carbon solute solution, solute, so in, solid, um, in solid solution, in solid solution. Okay, so you remember. I said that um, the solubility of ferrite, of uh, carbon, excuse me, in ferrites, almost nothing. Yes. So, in order to keep the carbon in solid solution, I, I need to make martensite. In fact, martensite is hmm, is what you get. as a result of a transformation. Yeah? By adding carbon in such solution, yes, I make a very hard transformation product yeah? that is interesting for engi many engineering applications. Okay? It's very important here. When we, s when we talk about Martensite or martensitic transformation, the result, the product does not have to be hard. Yes? yes. So there, martensite is very common in the world of material science. It's, it's in any um, um, material system that has transformation, you can probably make martensite. Yeah? Uh, ceramics, uh, other alloys, um, 
semiconductors, you know, it's not something that's only steel, right? So Martin and the the result, the Martin site, is a is the result of a military shear transformation. That's what Martin site is. Right? So it's not necessarily hard and strong and brittle, like you may think. Yes? The reason why it's hard and strong and brittle in the case of ferrous Martin site is because we have carbon in solid solution. Okay. Yeah? That makes it hard and brittle. Yeah? In fact, there are steels, some of the highest strength steels available, which are called Mar aging steels, yes, have a very soft Martin site. Very soft Martin site. So you can actually uh, make Martin site and uh, shape parts with this steel, yes. And then after that, you do a heat treatment to make it very hard, yes? But martensite does not have to be um, hard and brittle, okay? Right, so they want this phase, yes? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to simplify things, temperature and time. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to, uh, to make martensite? You need to just so this. These are, for instance, for instance, uh, perlite or bainite or. So um, log t. I'm going to make log t, and I'll say in a moment why I use log t here. If you um, have a thin sheet of material, and you put it in to a uh, quenching medium, which, which can be oil, special quenching oils, or um, other uh, water, for instance. Uh, if I put this down here, yes, I will, have, I will achieve a certain quenching rate, yes? And so, so for instance, if I go from 1,000 degrees C, I will be able to do this. Yes? Yes? Now, this looks like a curve, yes? It's because it's in a log diagram, yes? If I actually make a linear T, it's a line, okay? But because it's logarithmic, it looks like a curve, yeah? Okay? So, but if I have a part, for instance, that's a crankshaft, yes? Yeah? like this, yeah, a crankshaft, which has a certain section, yes. At the surface, I will be able to achieve this, yes, but not in the center, yes, not in the center. In the center, I'll get this, yes. So I'll be forming something else before I make martensite, yes. So in this case, if this is the transformation behavior of this particular steel, we, I say this is not a very hardenable steel, yes? I can only harden it if I increase the cooling rate somehow. Cooling, cooling rate, yes? Um, must be higher so that in the middle, the cooling rate is such this would be in the middle, and this would be at the surface. Huh? Okay. Or the other thing I can do, yes, is I will add alloying elements. Hmm? I will add alloying elements. I'll just use another steel, which has this transformation behavior. Yes. So then, with this cooling rate, I can still make it 100% martensite, and um, achieve. Uh, fully martensitic microstructure with this schooling rate. So, so there are different ways in which uh, we study in practice these, uh, this concept of hardenability. Uh, so we have the, the so-called Jomini test, and the other one is the quench test. So in the Jomini test, what do we do? We, have, we take a bar of this material, yes, yes, and we quench it. Yeah, we quench it. You see a picture here. 
This is the bar. You can see it's not, this is not paint. It's just at, in the austenitizing temperature, so it's red. And of course, the end here is being cooled by this water, so it, it looks dark, right? And, and as this cools, yes, you know, this, you can see the, the, the part again darker and darker, right? The one seconds, four seconds, five seconds. Okay, so, uh, so you do this. At, at this end here, of course, this end is quenched very quickly. But the cooling rate here and here and here and here becomes progressively less. Yes? So in general, if you then measure the hardness, yes, you see that you only have these very high hardnesses very close to the quench end, and then it decreases. Yes? You, can, there, you can do this kind of test, or you can do a quench test where you basically, again, take a bar, yes, and now you cool it from the side, yes, and uh, you cut it, and then you measure the hardness profile, yes. The more martensite you have, the higher the hardness, yes, and you see here the hardness drops, yes, at the center where the cooling rate is the lowest, you have um, the softest material, yes. This, this profile here, you have to realize, is a function of the steel's hardenability and what is that? That's basically the composition, yes? So you have steels that will give you this hardness profile, right? So this one is a very hardenable steel, yes? Or you will have steels that will give you, the same steel will then give you this hardness profile, yes? So this is a very hardenable steel, okay? And this hardenability is, as I said, a function of the composition, yes? In other words, if you, have, if you have added alloying elements which influence th these kinetics by influencing the stability of these phases of, of the ferrite or... Uh, or influence the kinetics of the transformation, yes, then um, you, that's the way you engineer the hardenability, okay? So let's have a look a little bit more uh, now with certain cases. Yeah? So let's have a look at a 0.4 carbon steel. 0.4 is very common engineering steels, yes, mm -hmm. to make parts, for instance, motor parts. Mm -hmm. um, okay? So, um, well, let's have, first we start with uh, a steel called 1040. It has, um, this is a, we'll talk about standards uh, after this introductory, introduction class here. Uh, this 40 here, first of all, let, let me uh, backtrack here. This, this is a, um, a standard which is in um, AISI SAE standard, North American standard, very common, very commonly used, yes? And it means that you have 0.4% of carbon. The last two digits give you the carbon content, yeah? And um, so, so it doesn't have much of alloying uh, elements. So this is what you measure as a function of the quenched end, yes? Um, so you see a very quick drop off of the hardness as a function of, yeah. Now I add alloying elements. Here in this case, half a percent chrome and 0.2% of moly, yes. You can see now the hardness is here, yes. I can continue adding alloying elements, chrome, and 1.8% of manganese. And now the, the steel is extremely hardenable, yes, okay. So from this hardness, yes, I can uh, get to know hmm, what is the, uh, uh, the, the hardness here that corresponds to the, the, the amount of martensite that corresponds to this hardness. Hmm? So if I have here, at say um, 45, a rock wool hardness of 45, yes, 
Yes? So what I show here is the hardness as a function of the carbon content, yes, for different amounts of martensites in the microsphere. So the more martensite I have, the harder, yes? The more carbon I have in the same amount of, um, amount of martensite, the higher the hardness, yes? So say for instance, this is 100%, close to 100% of martensite. The more martensite, the more carbon I add in the martensite, the harder it gets. So, um, right, so, so this point is important, 45 uh, Rockwell C, because this corresponds to, so I know in this particular steel I have 0.4% of carbon, yes? So 0.4%, I have this hardness, yes? So how much martensite I have? 50%, yeah? In this, in this steel, microstructure, okay? okay? So, for instance, in this case, yes, where do I have 50% of martensite? Here, right? Okay, this very, very close to the, it's already 50%, not 100%, 50%. Now, at this carbon content, where, what's the hardness for 100%? Everything is turned into martensite. Martensite waypoint. That's, that corresponds to this point. Yeah? So this point should corres corresponds to what? Well, that's what we have at the surface. Okay? So surface, I have, just from measuring the hardness and using this diagram here, I know that I have 100% of martensite, and the martensite contains 0.4% of carbon. Hmm? So it's... From this carbon, con uh, from this diagram, I cannot have 65 hardness, right? Because that would require 100% of martensite. Oops, excuse me. Yes, but a lot more carbon. Okay. So this this is the maximum I can get. Okay. All right. So now the question is. Uh, how do I, how do I work with this in practice? Huh? The um, Jomini test, we have a flat end, yes, um, and we cool this end. Yeah? But uh, there are not many parts that we treat this way. Yes, usually what we have are bars, or you know something that's cylindrical. Yes, and then you know we you need to have something to, um, because most of the producers of steels, steel companies, they will, uh, they will give you this kind of tests, test results, yes? And so you want to be able to know, okay, well, if I have a bar with a certain uh, uh, diameter, yeah, you know, where can I expect, how much diameter should the bar be, uh, or can the bar be, so, so to make sure we still have 50% of martensite in the center, for instance, yeah? Okay. All right, well, we'll answer this question on, on Thursday because it would take a little bit too long. And I say, I'd rather have you understand it well. So we'll uh, break here and uh, we'll talk about the, um, the parameters that come into play, and in particular, uh, the coolant, uh, as you will see, uh, comes into play in this uh, approach. All right, so again, for those who were not here uh, this morning, um, the, um, this quiz Thursday.